Hello, today is uh, Friday, the uh, 13th day of September 2013. My name is Derek and welcome to this weekend's Silver Chart Analysis. Before we get into the Silver Charts, I have a different chart on the screen. And I'm not going to point out yet what it is. Maybe a couple people of the few hundred people watching may know right now what it is. I'll give a few clues. Three of them, uh, many more, will figure it out, figure it out after the clues. First clue is the dates and levels are real. I am starting this in 1919, but I could have started this a few before, but only a few years beforehand. Clue number two, levels always start at zero and can only go higher from its current point. 2013, as of September the 13th, is 49, with a few handful of days to go. The highest point is 73 from 2001. Okay, now a few dozen people have figured this out. Now, especially with this clue, if you're able to get this correct, then you would have hit this one out of the ballpark. Okay, so the contents for today. The first thing is we're going to go over some silver charts, the daily, weekly, and the two-hour term time frames. Also showing the indicator that I have, the no-name indicator on overbought and sold conditions. Two, we're going to go over this opening chart, not too, too much, but we'll, I'll put some other charts that will relate to that chart regarding economics, and we're going to finish it off with the top two picks for the NFL for week number two. So without further ado, let's uh, get on within the silver chart on Thursday, down 6.85%. Maybe not too, too much to get excited about a 3% update today as it only retraced a portion of what it had lost the previous day. Okay, so I mentioned here about one consecutive day below the 18 average of lows on Thursday, day number two, Friday, day number three. The band, of course, is in a declining mode. So the prediction in which making it to 26 before this outcome would occur is that of an incorrect prediction. So as far as what we can see here now, a very interesting setup, which uh, should show us next week that volatility is going to increase. We can see here that this support level, the 38.2% Fibonacci from the 18 at 20 lows and the 24 or the 25 small change highs, did retrace 38.2%, but it didn't hold it for that long. And uh, it closed today right at that level. So it's a really, really interesting situation as we look at this at the current point. A very quick move up to this level. So now you have to ask yourself, A, is this going to be resistance where it uh, breaks below it? So instead of finding decent amount of support there, it finds resistance. And then we'll head to its next support level of a 61.8% correction and at around 20 and 3 fifths. That would be the first possibility. Is this going to be a failed breakdown? After all, it, uh, if it has a fast move on the start of the session next week where it manages to make it up to the 23 level, then that would be a possible indicator. Of course, it'd be making it to this 18 average band. So therefore, it's uh, probably be a lot better to look more at the weekly chart for scenarios that could come into play. But obviously, when you see this thing breaking above previous highs, then you would expect an explosion to continue further because you would see A, it goes below this band, and then of course this band barely declining as it goes back up here. This band would start to go sideways again. And then of course breaking past these key resistance points because of the two things, again, A, below the band, two, below FIB support, and then quickly breaking above it that would indicate the possible of that failed move. And then again, you gotta look at the possible failed move in here where you break this key resistance, this trend line was declining for an extreme amount of time. So then it finally broke through, looking to possibly change the intermediate trend. And then that, of course, that intermediate trend changes and it just 
starts to go lower, that could be very dangerous. We'll take a look more at that on, well, let's do the next chart, which is the two hour term time frame. Each one of these candles representing two hours of movements. A few things that I want to point out here is that situation here where you're in a downtrend. You have a really fast move, a big size candle that's looking to possibly change the direction of the trend, the direction of the band directly switch from down to up. But then it came down, found some support within this area, did not get above that high. Oftentimes from failed moves creates fast moves. This in here was absolutely no exception. The next thing that I want to look at was what occurred early in the morning a few couple days ago. This candle here that I'm drawing in, it's an outside period within a downtrend. Now what occurred in here was it first went lower, barely taken out the uh, lows from that day. And then it made highs not seen for, from a significant amount of time, closing up and closing above even this high. So now you have a situation where something big was going to occur. The easiest thing is, is really breaking in here, then maybe you'd expect a decent up move and breaking below the support, decent down move. Obviously did not break above here did break down below there, decent down move. It ended the session by making it to highs, well at least it broke above this high, this previous high. So it ended the day with a higher high as well as quickly going above the band, sort of like you see here. So the same old theory that I talk, I've talked about for so long is going to be true. Will it be able to hold this low 22 area and then break whichever resistance level in, that it establishes? That's going to be the key focus there for, again, failed moves, fast moves. This, if this is a failed move, breaking down below 21, then back to the daily chart, there's the test of, of course, 2060. Okay, so that's that one. Let's now go to the weekly term time frame. And the move that brought us lower brought exactly down to this 18 average band. There's a situation of the pattern again, where you break above it, unable to get above this high in here, breaking down really two key support levels here. There's the failed move. So same sort of analogy, breaking above this resistance 2512, then it's almost a surety we're going to 26 and potentially even higher than that. If it makes a lower high or continues to head lower, thus breaking it down below this uh, key support level or that significant Fibonacci level at around 2060, then two situations come into play. A, the test of 1821. B, the break of that level. And then where will that significant breakdown take us to? 1750, 1650, 16. Who knows? Now, as far as longer term analysis, I'm not going to talk about that in today's video. I will next talk about long term analysis when one of three things occurs. One, a move up to the 26 area. Two, the 2050 area uh, doesn't hold and has a decent confirmation it's going to go below it. Or C, two weeks from now. So that's when I will talk about the long term analysis next. Okay, I'm going to move on next now to uh, the uh, number two, which is the opening chart relating to economics. So if uh, all you wanted was the silver information, thank you for tuning in and I'll talk to you later for those continuing on. What uh, was that chart? I, I think I made the clues maybe a little too easy. It was the maximum or the home run leaders from every season from 1919 to 2013. Now I'm going to expand this even further because well, really this is it. You got Babe Ruth in here making some records. 
And then the record got broke, I think, by Roger Maris. So I got the date I'm going to go to in just a little bit. Then you have the steroid era, which uh, broke uh, some decent amount, but that's pretty much the chart for the most home runs in a season right now. This is the most right now for this year. So what I have, so here's the list here, Babe Ruth, 1919, so I took his first year. And the number on the right-hand side, and I'm going to do charts on this, is how many dollars and thousands they made for that year. So in 1919, Babe Ruth made $10,000. Don't have all of the data, but I have, surprisingly, the first years up to 42, not every year after that. I don't know how much Rudy York made in 1943, nor do I care too, too much, but I kind of would like to have it for the data, but I got enough data for what I need. So no, I don't care too, too much now. Here's a list of other home run uh, winners. For whatever reason, Willie Stargell didn't get his salary, and even more so, Mike Schmidt. Couldn't get much on that. 1983 really was the last. Tony Armas hit 43 home runs in 1985, and this was his 86 salary. I don't know how much he made in 85, but I'm sure it was close to that. And here we have the rest of them. And right now, Chris Davis leads uh, with 49 in uh, 2013. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a chart with just these payrolls. And we have to do it in logarithmic because in 1919, it was 10,000. And the last, the largest home run leader ever was in 2007, which is Alex Rodriguez, who made $27.7 million. So without further ado, let's now go to that uh, chart. This is the home run leaders, just their salaries. So the Babe Ruth era took a decent amount of time before players made what Babe Ruth did. Sort of like the stock market. When the stock market topped in 1929, it took about the decent amount of time. And fr this is freakishly very close to what the stock market looks like as well, as far as its up and down movements. But with that being said, you can see the big breakout that occurred within the late 70s that has no sign yet of stopping. Now, when you get these low numbers here, those are guys that hit home runs when they're young. So Chris Davis, no one, I didn't know who this guy was before this year. I'm not even that big of a baseball fan. I, I didn't know who Ryan Howard was until I just did this. So big baseball fans are like, really? You never heard of him? 58 home runs in 2006. Yeah, I don't really follow it too much. But we can see here that Ryan Howard didn't make too much. In 2006, he made 355000 compared to all of the uh, others. So you see here Juan Gonzalez, Young. I remember collecting baseball cards at the time. I tried to get as many Juan Gonzalez rookie cards that I could. What a terrible investment that turned out to be. Really didn't have much tangible value to it. As fiat currency doesn't have much tangible value to it as well. Okay, so continuing on further within this, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to compare the home run leader salaries with minimum wage salaries. And here we have it. The yellow orange line, I should say, the orange line represents what the minimum wage was. So back in here it was just pennies. And here we now got it up to about uh, seven and a quarter. And what's interesting is we can see how they really worked in line together. This worked together, and then up here it's pretty much the same. And then as we hit the 1980s, huge uh, pay increase for baseball players and really anything for the industry where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. This shows you the rate of ascent for wages has hardly gone up. The rate of ascent for fiat currency on the market has largely gone up. And of course, food stamp usage has also largely gone up. And around 2008, 2009, the mainstream media news of recovery, right around here, also largely went up. Okay, so that's it for... This particular part of the uh, analysis, the final part, and there's only seconds left now, 
will be the picks for NFL. So those leaving now, thank you for tuning in. I'll see you later on. And my picks for week number two. Last week I hit one game right, which was Tennessee. I'm going to pick them again. Taking nine points in Houston. If you want to know why I like them, you can read that. The second pick or the second best pick of the week is laying two and a half points at home for the Indianapolis Colts to take out the Miami Dolphins. So thank you for tuning in to this weekend's video, and I'll talk to you later on next week. Bye-bye.